Hello, I'm Bisar Sleiman from Lebanon. I own a marine consultancy and brokerage company called Tia Marine, and I'm a livestock vessel owner and trader. Both the livestock and the maritime industry are heavily male dominated. Breaking stereotypes? Yes, I most definitely am. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Sanjam for organizing this conference. It really is a pleasure to be speaking here today about my work as a livestock vessel owner, uh, opening Wista in Lebanon, uh, women today in the industry, and how gender diversity benefits the maritime world and how we can implement change. But before I begin, I want to start out with a story from my childhood. I remember as a kid, my father would come back home from work, tired, uh, smelling like manure, to which my sisters and I would get repulsed by and start complaining loudly. My father would always stop the complaining with one sentence. He'd say, don't say ill, ya baba, you must be proud. That's the smell of money. You see, we are a third generation livestock family business. We are international traders, uh, farm and vessel livestock owners, and we are the pioneers in opening new markets in this very niche industry. Flash forward from childhood to university years, I was part-timing at the farm in Beirut. I sometimes, uh, I didn't have uh, enough time to change my farm clothes to go to class. So mimicking my father, I too did not smell great at times. And I could hear the students chitter chatter uh, behind me because I would always sit in front of the class. So I did the same thing and proudly gave the famous line, it's a smell of money. Being a livestock vessel owner requires a lot of responsibility. You have to balance and take care of your crew, the environment, the vessel itself, your customers, your suppliers, and of course the cargo. It's not dry or wet or liquid or steel or wood. It is a precious cargo. It is living, breathing, and must be dealt with uh, care. The vessel is like a floating farm equipped with excellent ventilation, crew and stockmen that take care of the animals 24-7 food and water, including fresh water generators, a special hospital pens in case an animal needs extra care and so on. So throughout the years, uh, 15 to be exact in the maritime field, although coming from a privileged background, there were several obstacles I had to go through. Being a young lady surrounded um, by mostly entitled and gender biased men was quite the challenge. I realized when I went down to the port and in most of our work meetings, I was almost the only woman in the group. It was, it was a struggle being heard, being valued, being uh, appreciated. I mean, I mean, just because I was a woman. So in my early years, I assumed that maybe it's a Lebanon thing, maybe it's an Arab mentality and culture that you know women do not work in the shipping industry. But little did I know that gender bias was even in the most developed and forward-thinking cities like London. I had a meeting there with a big company in which they were trying to win us as clients for a big tender that we issued, uh, meaning they had to put their best foot forward. So in that meeting, um, during our coffee break, there were two men making fun of an organization called Wista. I didn't know what Wista was then. I asked, what Wista, what is it? Uh, and they laughed it off and answered, oh, just some women playing around with boats. I went back to the hotel room that day and did my research and saw that Wista is a huge global organization made up of strong, hardworking, ambitious women, just like me. An association to empower, promote, connect women in shipping, whose aim is to close the gender gap. So imagine me there, I'm, I'm there with these two feelings simultaneously fighting each other. One was happiness to have found like-minded women trying to make a difference. And the other was frustration that these men who need my approval to do the business had the audacity to make fun of women that represent me. FYI, they didn't win the tender, but not because of those reasons, even though it kind of made me happy that they didn't. Uh, it became my priority to open Wisto in Lebanon. 
but boy, what I had to face. Government, corruption under resignation, an economic crisis that devalued our currency, the Lebanese lira, by over 85%. Uh, extreme and unprecedented capital control by the banks, a garbage crisis, daily electricity cuts of over 12 hours, uh, dealing with a pandemic, and above all, a horrific and cataclysmic uh, explosion in our major port, Beirut, that destroyed the city. Uh, it killed hundreds, it injured uh, thousands, and it displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Despite all that, I'm proud to say that I have opened Wista Lebanon as its founder and president with 13 strong, united, and work-driven women. Although growing in some industries, women are still very underrepresented in key industries like technology. Women make up 15 to 24% in STEM industries, and technology and innovation is the future of shipping, so that needs to change. Among the world's largest 500 companies, only about 11% of senior executives are women. There aren't accurate statistics yet for women in shipping. The one that everyone uses is that women make up 1-2% to of the shipping industry, which is inaccurate because there isn't enough uh, data. Reporting, monitoring, research, and collecting data are all necessary to measure progress progress. We need statistics as soon as possible. It helps us see where the challenges are. From what I understand, the UN is working with several associations to get these numbers. Talking about challenges, COVID-19. The COVID-19 crisis could set women back half a decade. All the progress that we have seen over the past five years, no matter how little uh, it is, it could be wiped out due to many women thinking they need to leave their work or actually being let go. You see, most women work a double, if not a triple shift. A full day of work, then hours taking care of children, and then maybe housework. The support that made this possible, including schools, childcare, leaving them at family members' houses, like grandparents, all of these have stopped due to COVID. So as a result, according to McKinsey's research, something that was unthinkable six months ago is happening now. And it's that one in four women are contemplating downgrading, shifting, or even leaving their job. At the same time, this crisis gives room for opportunity, which I will discuss further in a bit. So women remain a largely underutilized source of talent and labor. Women and diversity make industries better. One example is according to the UN Global Compact, if women and men participated equally, the world economy could gain $28 trillion by 2025. Should organizations choose to make diversity, inclusiveness, and gender equality part of their policy and embed it in their business strategy, they will thrive. Companies with more women executives are more profitable and more innovative and more respected. So more profitable, Recent research from McKinsey shows that gender diverse businesses are 15% more likely to outperform financially above the industry median. Innovation. What is innovation? Innovation is trial and error. And if there are skills, different skills being brought to the table along with support structure, innovation blooms. Diversity from gender but also cultural diversity, age, race, has been shown to breed creativity and innovation, and that pushes organizations forward. Substantial research found that companies that have women in top management roles experience what we call innovation intensity and produce more patents by an average of 20% more than teams with male leaders. If that's not enough, Accenture's new research su suggests that innovation is six times higher at companies where men and women are treated most equally. As I said before, technology is the future for shipping, meaning the shipping industry's sustainability depends 
on innovation. Knowledge, experience, and technical skills are essential to success in your career. However, the most desirable CEO attributes are that of soft skills. Women excel in soft skills and emotional intelligence needed for business leadership. leadership. By that I mean competencies like emotional self-awareness, empathy, teamwork, effective communication, conflict management, and adaptability. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that women do a better job, but the numbers and outcomes show that gender diversity, men and women working together improves a company's performance significantly. The impact of putting women in charge is significant. If it gives a company a better chance of hiring and keeping the most qualified and also a better workplace environment, a happier one, diversity, diversity itself does that. It doesn't stop at gender, a happy environment. It increases productivity. People like to work with happy people. It inspires creativity, courage, it reduces stress, and it has this contagious and multiplying effect of success. How to implement the change? We need to change the system that prevents women from reaching their potential. The United Nations Sustainable Deve Development Goals is a great starting point. However, the current slow rate of change will take over 100 years for us to meet these goals. Um, especially given the setbacks of COVID-19. So I do not believe SDG 5, which is the gender equality goal, will be met by 2030. I also believe that all the UN SDGs can be accomplished faster if SDG 5 is given priority and if it gets met first. It will work like a domino effect. Because of the setbacks of the pandemic and the very slow growth rate of women in the maritime industry, I believe temporary strong measures should be the priority for us to see accelerated change. For example, people call them numerical targets, but I use a different word. Uh, enforcing, dare I say, quotas and policy making in companies and ports and associations to ensure women are equally represented in every field. Alongside complementary extra training programs. These are temporary because they will be stop being they will stop being enforced once gender parity is achieved and for a good amount of time. Another one, mentorship programs to offer industry advice, eventually offering work opportunities to assist women to climb the career ladder, teach women who are hesitant to negotiate salaries and ask for a raise. Entrepreneurship, just like I opened my company, Tia Marine. A woman being her own boss, setting her own terms, opening her own agency, brokerage, ship management company. We should support women-led startups. Hire each other. Foster a new generation of women in leadership. Education. Scholarships, schools and universities, offering events, seminars, courses on gender equality, celebrating and discussing women in shipping teaching them how to unlearn cultural gender bias. For example, the choice of words when a man is being assertive and ambitious, a woman is thought to be bossy. Flexible working hours. Given COVID and women contemplating leaving their jobs, companies can create better flexible hours. I mean, Henry Ford's 1920 archaic nine to five industrial you know, system is outdated and not relevant. Performance should be based on results, not on how many hours they clock in and laws that discriminate, provide statistics and research. There are many strategies. Think of the untapped human resources potential that females, that women can have as an impact to the maritime community. Gender equality and ultimately reaching gender parity in the maritime industry is important, not only because it's the right thing to do or because it's fair, but because it directly correlates to the industry's economic performance. The choices companies make today, the choices we all make today, either individually or collectively, could shape the workplace for women and men for decades to come, for better or for worse. Thank you for listening, and I will leave you with a short message from Wista Lebanon's member, Sara Haidar, the container terminal manager at Beirut Port, who will discuss her and her team's outstanding emergency response to the August 4th explosion. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sara Haidar. I'm the terminal manager at the Beirut Container Terminal at the port of Beirut. Uh, I started working there uh, directly after my graduation. 
and uh, I've been there for the past 15 years, occupying the role of terminal manager for the past seven years. Working in a men's world was and is definitely challenging, especially that I manage a 24-7 operation that works 365 days nonstop. I was lucky, though, working with uh, an organization that supports women and its role in management. Uh, we are proud today to have 50% of our management team as females. I would, rely, I would relate my success uh, to the support I received from my management in the first place and from my family, uh, especially that I'm a mother for two little boys. And second, to the passion I have for this industry, uh, which has played an integral uh, role to why I am where I am today. Uh, in the past, over the past years, we have encountered many challenges uh, at the port of Beirut and at the container terminal. But what happened uh, after the port explosion on August 4 was one of its kind. Uh, especially that we unfortunately lost 10 of our colleagues. Uh, three of them were in operation, uh, key operation roles. Uh, directly after the explosion, the challenge was to have an immediate uh, response and risk mitigation plan. And this is uh, why we had immediate response from the team and they were uh, immediately involved in the search and rescue for people that were uh, at the terminal uh, at the time of the explosion and then at inspecting all the uh, damages of the equipment and facilities to make sure that we identify the risks and mitigate them. And, and finally, to set a plan uh, to resume a p operation, especially that we had a, a mother vessel at the key at the time of the explosion, uh, because we wanted to have a clear plan to resume operation safely and taking into account all the customer needs. Uh, with the hard work of all the team at the terminal day and night, and with the coordination with all the uh, with all the uh, port authority and other uh, and other agencies, we were able to resume operation three days after the explosion and sail safely the vessel that was the mother vessel that was at the key, and then uh, on August 10, the port resumed vessel and yard operation. Uh, Finally, I'm, I, I would like to tell you that I'm very excited to be part of WISTA as I support this initiative. More women are needed in the industry. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Bisar for all the hard work she has been putting to open WISTA Lebanon. And uh, thank you, Bisar, and thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Greetings, Excellencies, distinguished audience, ladies, gentlemen and Honourable Delegates of the Shipping Ministry of India, in particular Director General of Shipping Mr. Amita Kumar and all of the generous sponsor of Maritime Shia. Hello and good afternoon. I am Sayyida Hijazi and I would like to start by expressing my sincere appreciation to the Board of Maritime Shia and the inspiring leader and founder Ms. Sanjam Gupta for all of her efforts to make this essential gathering a reality. As this conference is for the support and development of women in leadership within the maritime sector and furthermore improving our maritime system to our the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, I would like to reinforce the fact when humanity harnesses the force of and truly empowers women, it has an exponentially positive effect on any society. Women have been at the forefront of many important fields of research, study and have been the backbone of community development, seeking organisational integrity throughout the ages. The shipping sector should not remain reluctant to our talented and hard working women. Women captains, marine engineers, sailors, maritime lawyers, owners and so forth who have already joined this industry have improved our global sector immensely. An increase of qualified women would make it a stronger steel by a continuous contextual consciousness. In today's presentation, 
I wish to place emphasis on the fact of sustainable human rights for sustainable shipping, that any advance in sustainable shipping would be the result of instilling and employing and waiving human rights principles. Improper protection and unbalanced human rights policies are critical issues that have exponentially increased historically with the growth of our shipping. There are grave consequences of improper legal and policy system and insufficient monitoring system for human rights at sea. They cause multitudes of abuses and violences on individuals that must be strongly challenged by our cooperation and dedication towards achieving sustainable and organized human rights. With regard to implementing human rights in shipping, and with the adoption of 2010 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, the IMO has addressed the leading key metrics of sustainable development for sustainable shipping. The approach of sustainable shipping to sustainable human rights promotes and protects our seafarers, men, women, and non-gender specific population, regardless of origin, or circumstance to empower them. Achieving sustainability would apply to interconnected domains and subdomains indicators by judicial and non-judicial mechanism, economic and business actors, driven by organized human rights principles and implementations. From a constitutional point of view, on one hand, human rights in shipping complies with human rights indicators and standards in international law, maritime and law of the sea. On the other hand, sustainable human rights in shipping complies with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I'll take this moment to conclude my point by referring to the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights to ensure that business activities and private companies in shipping do not engage in abuse, disregard human rights, or partake discriminatory practices. Perhaps the legal and enforcement key shall be implementing human rights at sea by expanding principles beyond territorial waters and throughout high seas. As this conference is to inspire women in maritime, I wish to share some words with young ladies as a student considering my educational human rights and maritime experience. You have faced difficulties such as gender bias, ethic and cultural discrimination, a lack of access to education, or even written resources material to learn, and many other issues. I stand here before you as a stark reminder that in this new and honorable maritime field, nothing matter but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your gender, not your social and economic status. Take the risk and put forth the effort to learn. By these efforts of the IMO, Global Partnership, and many charities and organizations to support seafarers' rights, by 2030, we will no longer suffer any gender inequality, no further human rights abuses and violations at sea. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be here for your further considerations and questions. I'm Suniti Bala, ex-chief engineer and co-founder International Women's Seafarers Foundation. We are a three-year-old organization with member strength of approximately 400 across the globe. 
The organization is for the women seafarers by the women seafarers. We are glad today to share our thoughts on this platform, which includes all the chiefs from maritime. In year 2010, STCW Resolution 14 included promotion of participation of women in maritime industry. After nine years, in 2019, empowering women in maritime community was selected as the World Maritime Day theme. Intention was to provide an opportunity to raise awareness of the importance of gender inequality. This was in line with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. This proposal by IMO Secretary General Mr. Kitak Lim, endorsed by IMO Council, became instrumental in bringing the much needed attention and awareness about the women seafarers to the world shipping. And here we are at the year end 2020, discussing about encouraging and promoting women seafarers yet again. We all know that participation of women seafarers in maritime community is very small. And it's almost constant from decades. There is no significant increase. So the question arises, is this area of concern? If we all acknowledge this question and agree this is a concern, then it leads to some fundamental questions. Is the direction right? Are we only talking till now or are we walking the talk? Do we really know the reasons of not having increased participation of women in shipping? While asking these questions, we also need to remember that we, when we are intending to increase the number and participation, this cannot be done without ensuring the ample job opportunities. We as IWSF have assisted in providing placement to more than 50 girls so far. At IWSF, together with a group of almost 400 women seafarers, guiding and hand-holding each other, have tried to find some answers to these questions by sharing our experiences, thoughts, issues, and concerns. While the discussion lead to so many possibilities, it's really disheartening to find that the girls are facing exactly the same issues which we had faced decades ago. In my sailing days, we thought we are facing these challenges because our presence is new. It's new to the industry and people. They are not used to of having us on board and they are adapting. We expected that in a couple of years, it will be all over. We were wrong. Even after the decades later, the issues are exactly the same. And that brings to the question back, is the direction right? We are trying to seek the mindset of gender equality or rather say, uproot the gender inequality. But we should not forget that we are hitting a conditioned mind. Possibly we may need to go back uh, to little younger generation for proper serial. So, at IWSF, we started with small initiatives and we are reaching out to primary and secondary schools to carefully assess and understand the mindset. We started spreading the awareness on seafaring profession and as well as all the possibilities of women participation. Together with MAPS, we participated and are running a doctorship program for school children. There is not a single answer to these questions. Perhaps if all of us do our bit and identify the most probable answer, whatever answer it is, and start looking towards it, I guess in a span of very short time, we will not have to face the same questions. Let's talk about next question. Are we walking the talk? It is interesting to observe 
that many of us or almost all of us came together with a very good intention, talked excellent on various fora and eventually go back with good pleasant memories and then again and again the cycle continues. Possibly now is the time where we believe we can act upon our learnings and the thoughts we shared with each other. Just need to act with our own thought process and beliefs. If all of us do our bit, it's only a matter of time. We will see that what we were talking has become reality. And the third question, do we really know the reason for such a less participation of women in maritime. As I said before, reasons can be many. Pick your reason and please work on them. We are trying our bit as per our findings. From my side, I will highlight one small need. In fact, a responsibility from Mother Nature, which comes as an obstacle in choosing this profession. And that is our biological clock. The clock is ticking all the time. And there are social expectations, there are family demands, and above all, our personal desire to be mother, which is perceived obstacle in the seafaring requirements. But believe me, it's a matter of sheer planning and running your priorities. Instead of getting confused, it comes automatically when you look for the solution. I'm mother of two and plan them after getting my chief engineer sailing. If I have done it, I guess all of others can. If we acknowledge this question and disagree this is as a concern, then again it leads to some fundamental questions. Just to remind on the concern, the possible concern which I shared was limited woman participation. So for those who disagrees with the concern, at least those who are seafarers, they can just imagine or just imagine your ship where you have sailed with a family. And unknowingly, more than 90% of you will acknowledge an unexplainable difference which you have already observed. And that is the difference I'm talking about. Now, when we deal with organization, it is possible to have bigger impact, faster change. If some changes can be brought into the set practice and organization policies, probably all those who acknowledge this is a concern will automatically be able to set the ball rolling. Many suggestions from our side for the organizations are put in a form of policy guidelines we brought up in year 2018. And it was unveiled no other than by then DG Shipping Dr. Marley Shankar. And subsequently with joint effort, it was adopted in form of MS Notice 7 of 2019 after having industry suggestions uh, by Indian government in year 2019. And it was under the leadership of present Director General of Shipping, Mr. Amitabh Kumar. We are really uh, thankful to him for this. What we see here is that Indian administration has played a pivotal role in World Maritime Chapter. I now appeal the audience and all the international bodies to support, develop or adopt the recommendation if they agree with the concern. Just to give a small glimpse of what it covers, it is the guidelines, recommendations, and best practices which can be readily adopted by any of the ship owning company or the ship managing company. When we were preparing these guidelines in the year 2017 during the study and survey, we faced some interesting questions or say facts. We also realized on our ignorance as a system on where we are lacking. Questions were, do we have any record? Do we know where we are standing today as a nation or group of nations? Are we the fence sitters? 
and somehow we found the expected but not so good answers. That is for records, there is limited data, lack of specifics, absence of mechanisms to measure where we are standing and most of the stakeholders are having fence-sitter approach. What I will request to all fence-sitters is to let the gravity do work, jump onto the ground and believe me, this will lead to much bigger sense of achievement and satisfaction. When a girl joins first time on board, it's not only hard for her who is new to the atmosphere where she is all by herself, but it is also different for the crew who will be responsible for conducive work environment on board, for her work environment on board. With the multinational environment and different socio-educational background, there is always a gap on perception of the girl on board and the expectation of the personnel creating the environment. The reaction and the results will be ultimately deciding the future of cancer. This lack of experience related to matters of women seafarers at organization level is for simple reason that so far the number of women seafarers have been so so low that there is a lack of experience building. For example, if medium scale organization hires a woman first time as a seafarer, they mostly lack a structured approach through policies and procedures for the matters related to her employment, especially matters considered taboo like sexual harassment. So towards the end, I will appeal to all individuals and the organizations to just do their own bit and to start acting somewhere rather than nowhere or anywhere as you find fit. It's not important what aspects are chosen to act upon. The important part is that we choose to act. It is time to act. Thank you all for patient listening and thanks to all concerned for at least thinking to act. Wish you all very happy new year 2021. Dear Sanjam, dear friends and colleagues, we were looking forward to meet in the beautiful India in Mumbai, but unfortunately COVID-19 maybe changed our plan. But I'm really glad that we were able to meet even during our conference today in the, in the room. So being a medical doctor and maritime medical doctor, I would like to talk today about the health of women seafarers and their needs. So, maritime medicine is lined between two historically significantly male dominated professions, medicine and seafaring. Only in the end of 19th century, women gained the right to study for the same qualifications as men. Even in the 21st century, we were facing the, I can call it tragedy, because uh, the journalists revealed in Japan that in medical schools, uh, the, uh, the entrance exams for were manipulating for decades to restrict the number of female students and ensure more male to become a doctors. Can you imagine how many bright girls we restricted just because that somebody saw that males are better doctors and they lose this possibility to be doctors and save their human lives and uh, health. So women played a big role in the maritime history, which were often unnoticed or hidden. They were pirates, naval officers, scientists, lighthouse keepers, and divers. The term seaman was replaced by gender neutral seafarer only in 2005 during the 900, uh, 294 session of ILO. And we have a very little evidence about the women's seafarers' health and their needs. 
In 2015, in joint initiative by IT, the International Seafarers Welfare and Assistance Network, the International Maritime Health Association, and the Seafarers Hospital Society revealed the women's seafarers' top health and well-being concern. The survey underlined how relatively little research has been done so far into women's working lives at sea. So the online pilot survey to find out how women currently working and see view their health needs conducted in June 2014 for two months and was completed by 100 respondents. After reviewing the questions and results, a revised survey was devised and conducted between December 2014 and April 2015. In addition to the survey, two focus group sessions were held in Cebu with 20 Filipino cruise ship work. So among the findings of the survey, which was completed by 595 women, the biggest at the time, was that nearly half of the respondents has a two main health issues. It was joint and back pain and stress, depression, and anxiety. The biggest issue preventing women seafarers accessing health care while at sea was lack of confidentiality and over half of respondents was welcome routine wellness check. Pregnancy was not mentioned in the survey report. In the ILO some years ago was a big discussion concerning the obligatory pregnancy testing uh, for women's affairs. And I tried to explain to the auditorium who was, well, to be frank, I was the only doctor that even we really protect the women, uh, you know, the obligatory pregnancy testing, it, it's, it's not the way. Because, you know, first it can be still negative while the lady is pregnant and the second we're not just uh, holding the lady by hand after the PME and not going with her to the ship so during this time gap between leaving the clinic and uh, joining the vessel everything can happen so during the PME, the woman can be pregnant, but test can be negative. Or during the two years between the PME, so what shall we do with this? Pregnancy is not a pathology, but a physiological condition. It should be regarded as a part of everyday life, and the health and safety implication can be adequately addressed by normal health and safety management procedures. Many women work while they are pregnant and men return to work while they are still breastfeeding. However, the particular demands of working on board ship can place pregnant women at, and workers at risk. The employer should assess the risk to pregnant workers and implement reasonably practical measures to control those risks. If there is a significant risk at work to the safety or health of a pregnant woman, then the following steps may be taken according to the level of the risk. The temporary adjustment of working conditions and or house of work, provision of suitable alternative work if available, suspension from work, paid leave for as long as necessary, special consideration must be given to the night work. It is our responsibility to advise female crew that it might be in her best interest to know about the pregnancy before going at sea. It should be case by case assessment, of course, because we are different, the ladies are different, the pregnancies are different, and the pregnancy should be not taken as an absolute prohibition for work at sea. Here I would like to show you a few letters which I got after we published the results of the survey. 
uh, the lady was confessing that yes, indeed, uh, it was a problem with the maternity. One declared that she was discriminated by not harassed. And then I got one very interesting letter from the master who served uh, 20 years on the cargo ship. And she was asking why should the difference between male and women should be written in the stone? Are there no men with the same problems except, of course, for gynecology? If you want to work, let's say, as a woman, you know it's a man's work, and then you have to prove yourself by making it work. And here I would like to command that we have to change this. We have to change the slogan that this is a man's work. I fail being, uh, you know, to turn uh, president of International Maritime Health Association, believe me or not, but I faced the same kind of pressure by, from my male colleagues. And once one dropped me, exactly the same to my face, that this is a man's world. What are you doing here? Surprisingly, he was European. So, an attractive working environment with job security, encouraging and supported culture would be an efficient way to attract more women in the seafaring profession. One of the major concerns of women seafarers is losing necessary qualifications during the maternity leave. The continuous education and training should be guaranteed during this period in order to ensure their return to the woman seafarers back to her position after the break. It was another very interesting study uh, from the Central for Maritime Health and Society, University of Southern Denmark. In general, the women seafarers perceived themselves as having a very good health. Being away from the families was the reason of concern, which could be explained by the gender mentality and traditions. However, they emphasized that they did not want to be treated differently uh, than men. There is a long history of gender stereotypes to overcome. We need more cross-country research uh, in women's seafarers' health. This time, the research should be conducted with the control groups on shore, including such topics as consistent and improved approach to the maternity benefits and rights, access to the confidential medical advice and contraceptive, development of the sexual harassment policies, and appropriate training, including with the cadets training and education. Here's a very important point. We have to start the education from the level schools. We need to teach our boys to be a feminist, and this will help us in the future. So the research should be covered such an issues as a mental health, nutrition, gynecological complaints, joint and back, pain number one in the list of complaints, cardiovascular disease, female bees, male, because by sudden, remember, we were always telling that males has more often heart attack than the female. And suddenly we realized that this is wrong because all books are written and all the uh, symptoms are described, the male, symptoms. The women having it differently. So we really have to take it into consideration. So the wellness check, what, when and how often, coaching course and behavior change induced by a risk pattern prevention program. Here I want to mention the new initiative. We start with some colleagues uh, from the maritime uh, medicine field. In maritime health research and education net, it's not profit network of students and researchers to collaborate with Omega Net, of course, and we're ready to start a big uh, project in the research between the countries and different universities concerning the health and well-being of seafarers and of course the health 
the women's in Paris health, it's one of the top priorities. Thank you very much. In the year 2014, a young girl graduated in a maritime college with first class honors and excited over the world that she was about to set out into a world that is full of possibilities and she had the ambition of how soon she would work so hard until she was able to get command. It was until she faced the reality of life whereby she realized that not only her gender but also her African background played such a numerous or rather such a huge uh, contribution into her selections of uh, placement on board ships. This young girl was me. My name is Elizabeth Marami, currently a second officer on board Celebrity Cruises. But this did not just come as easy as I thought it would in 2014. In my quest to find for placement on board, I was rejected over 200 times by shipping companies telling me that either they do not hire females or they do not have um, say, sailors or rather officers from the African background. This for me was the most devastating time of my life. I was very depressed because I had all these ambitions crushed. But then during that time, I chose to pick myself up. And in my quest to find answers, I decided it was about time that the world understood this plight that women who are seeking to have a career at sea face. But I realized people cannot change what they did not know. And that's why I embarked on a journey called Digital Storytelling for Social Impact. Against the Tide was born in 2015 whereby I reached out to different women that I just had seen socially on social media and I just asked them if we could share their stories. I asked them to share what it is they wanted to change, what it is if they were given the opportunity would be their change and what were their worst times there so that we understand that we are not alone in this. I never thought in my wildest dream that Against the Tide would grow into becoming what it is today. However, digital storytelling has really played a significant role in today's industry, today's different industries, in the sense that we see that there are different platforms that are used to create change through digital storytelling. Because through telling a story, people understand the realities and, and, and what it is that these people face. I, it's different when you read it on print, but then it's another story when someone tells you, I went through this and I want this change. That way, we are able to understand exactly what it is. We are able to raise awareness. Against the Tide has not only grown to a space where people have shared their story, but it has grown to, a, to become a space where women have networked. I find women seafarers who have become sea sisters out of Against the Tide. And this brings me joy because in the beginning, I was on a quest to find answers. But then at the end, we not only found sisterhood, but we saw so many things that have been able to change. For example, the IMO was able to come up, was able to celebrate the International Maritime Day focused on women empowerment. And they asked us what was going to be our one change during the day of the seafarer. And this was one of the questions that came out of we had on Against the Tide. With that being said, I believe that I want to thank all the women who have shared their stories, who have been part of Against the Tide, who have, been, who have felt comfortable enough to tell their stories without shame so that a change may be placed, who have talked about their, their racial discrimination, who have talked about their gender discrimination, who have talked about their sexual orientation discrimination, who have talked about each and everything that was so personal so that someone may be able to see this and make a change out of it. This was not an easy task, but these women stepped up so that a change may be done. And so as you go out to read the stories, the policymakers, the people who are in shipping companies, the owners of shipping companies, those people who lay down the rules, see the stories, make the change, create the change in your companies, because we women desire so much to be at the top. But then when we work towards it, is the environment conducive for us also? Are there opportunities for us? It is different to dream 
and it is different to be able to achieve your dream to be given the support to achieve your dream so I want to thank each and everyone who has joined us on Maritime CEO. On behalf of all the ladies that have shared their stories and all the ladies who are going forward to share their stories, we at Against the Tide now registered as a foundation that is going to continue creating a network for women seafarers at sea whereby they can become sea sisters and find support through each other. We would just like to thank each and everyone who has been able to not only read our stories but also been able to implement policies through their stories from pregnancy policies and from policies that allow inclusivity and diversity and with that being said that doesn't mean that those who haven't done it should be left behind for those who have been left behind it's time to pull up it's time to pull up it's time to level up Namaste. My name is Krishna Dragomir, and I'm a associate professor at Constanza Maritime University, Romania. I will talk about global partnerships in smart transport for the SDGs accomplishment through the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect might be a more powerful tool of social change than we ever imagined. The butterfly effect is a metaphor related to the mathematician Edward Norton Lawrence regarding to details of a tornado like the path or the time of formation that might be influenced by minor perturbation such a distant butterfly flapping its wings several weeks ago or in another part of the globe. Related to the sector of smart transport, the butterfly effect would imply that minor events, for example, like academic events, academic conferences, might bring enormous change, societal change, very necessarily for the development of the society. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a document adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015. It contains 70 sustainable development and a number of 169 targets needed for development of countries. And in particular, we will refer now to SDG number 17, which is global partnerships. Based on our, our observation through Academic events, like an event that I will uh, further uh, give you as an example, several key targets of the SDG 17 global partnerships were accomplished by business representatives and stakeholders of the smart transport sector. Through academic events like conferences, business representatives get into contact with academia and the research and together appoint partnerships for investing in least developed countries or for knowledge sharing and cooperation for access to science, technology or innovation. In the first case for target 17.5, an indicator might be the number of countries that adopt and implement investment promotion regimes, including the least developed countries. For target 17.6, one indicator might be technical facts like fixed internet broadband subscription for a certain number of inhabitants or a certain smart transport technologies that is accessible to a certain number of people. For, further, through such events, business sector would bring best practices related to promoting sustainable technologies to developing countries. In such a case, an indicator for evaluating uh, this process would be the total amount of funding necessary uh, for developing countries in order to um, contribute to the development of 
smart transport technologies. And finally, another important indicator would be the proportion of individuals using transport technologies as a consequence of the strengthen of science, technology, and innovation capacity for least developed countries. During the business cycle, the investors reach crossroad choices when they have to make a decision. The decision can be a handy one or the decision can open difficult roads, but it's important the result. This year in autumn, a minor event happened in one of the countries on the globe. That uh, event called Smart Transport Summit. And even if there is no news on uh, browsers, internet browsers related to this event, I would like to give you this example as a butterfly effect case of effect that is the first of his kind. During this event was discussed how exactly that sector of trans smart transport can contribute to the accomplishment of the sustainable development goals. Various stakeholders from the trans smart transport sector opened discussion and shared best examples of um, business and knowledge sharing that is uh, very necessary for other um, sectors and other stakeholders that would like to develop global partnerships. There are several steps to consider sustainability based on the case study of the above mentioned event. For example, you should have in mind designing butterfly events, events that might be minor at the first sight, but in reality, in time can bring sustainable change. Secondly, policymakers with the business sector and research, academia, uh, civil society should share their best practices and perspectives concerning how transport innovations contribute the accomplishment of the SDGs. Academia will always have a key role to transmit and create knowledge in smart transport. And not only this, another important role would be creating a very necessary environment for businesses to bring change. Beyond mechanism of academic events, partnerships should be encouraged between speakers institutions in particular in respect to the aim of the SDG 17 global partnerships. You can have in mind the targets and the indicators mentioned before. Also, you should have in mind developing awareness on the SDGs accomplishment through your power of example. If your business contributes to the accomplishment of one of the SDGs, then you should specify this action during academic events. This is the perfect environment to inspire not only other businesses, but also the academia environment that generates knowledge. Further track and evaluate the impact of uh, your action. Identify whether your action will have in time butterfly effect with each edition of your event. This would be, in short, all the things I want to share with you. I thank you for your attention and I wish you good health.